is co-director, if I got that right, Yochai, at the uh, Berkman Center for Internet and Society, yeah. author of a magnificent book, The Wealth of Networks, and another magnificent book, The, Peng the Penguin and the Leviathan. I got the order right, yeah. yes. Uh, Rebecca McKinnon is now a, a senior research fellow at the um, New America Foundation, former CNN producer, uh, co-founder of Global Voices, correspondent, sorry, uh, Global Voices, and uh, author of the book, uh, The um, uh, Consent of the Networked. I think I got that right. And here we have Bob Carey, former senator, and um, also a member of the 9-11 Commission. So we're gonna talk NSA, and I think I'm switching mics, right? All right, welcome. Uh, a very important topic, uh, very important, especially with, with the Guardian behind us. Um, Bob. Yeah. Hello, good to see you. I see you. Um, because you were on the NSA Commission, because the Commission talked about the necessity of, of connecting dots, uh, I'd like you to talk about necessary security, and so we can get that on the table first of what is needed. And as part of that, what the Commission said in part, to oversimplify grossly, is that we didn't do a good job of connecting the dots. So my first question in this line is, does having more dots help? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a very effective metaphor to begin with, not when you stretch it out like <laughs> you've just done. Uh, it becomes even more useless. Um, because it isn't really about connecting dots. It's trying to uh, identify individuals who have made a decision uh, to use destructive force against the United States of America, either here or outside. And it's not just uh, the classic terrorists that we've come to know in the last 20 years that are using suicide as a technology, uh, but it's also people that are moving uh, large amounts of cash south uh, uh, in order to pay for drugs. I mean, there's some, there's, there's some people out there that want to do a significant amount of damage, and it's a, it's a constant uh, conflict that you're dealing with. Uh, with you know, it's outlined in the Declaration of Independence where you're trying to balance uh, domestic tranquility against you know, providing for the common defense. So you, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to do, especially when you've got an environment where you say you, of necessity, have to maintain secrecy. But try to strike that balance for us. I think that's what we're trying to do now. And, and when we end this panel, we're going to try to get back to what the balance ought to be and where we ought to fix this. But we'll well, this is why, this is why the metaphor of the dots doesn't work. Okay. The dots suggest this childhood thing that we did where, you know, you drew it and it's like, oh, my God, that's a dog. Right? Yeah, right. That's what you did. And uh, it, it, it's not that simple. It's not that perfect. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't allow you to uh, reach a final answer and say, oh, my God, that's... Uh, I know exactly what I have to do. It's a constant process of trying to balance, and it's a constant process of evaluating from the public's perspective of whether or not, that, whether or not we're doing it right. Or let me ask it a different way. Did the NSA go too far? Has it gone too far? Did it, in, in, in Alexander's efforts to collect everything, which I guess I understand, if you're a spy, you must spy. If you're, if you're gathering data, and that's what your job is, you gather more data. It trampled over, I would say, rights that we have. I would say you did. I mean, you said, God bless the Guardian to start here. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, that's a pretty amazing introduction. Um, yeah, God bless free press. <laughs> well, that's a different thing than God blessing a specific newspaper. Um, but, well, but this has been their story. Okay, well then, did the Guardian go too far? Did Snowden go too no, far? Did we stick with your first question? I mean, the problem okay. that you have, and among the, the the benefits of the disclosure, and there's substantial damage from the disclosure as well, and from a national security point of view, is that you get information you didn't have before. Uh, the same is true with the Chelsea Manning story. We, we got information we didn't have before. And part of the problem uh, that I see is there's, a, there's, there's way too much that's being kept in a classified environment. Okay. Uh, w and you know, when you keep it in a classified environment, the problem is there's nobody there to check your homework. And, uh, you know, you may be a decimal point or two off. Uh, and and uh, it's, it, it, we've established oversight uh, mechanisms but those oversight mechanisms are exceptionally difficult. So the straight answer to your question is, I don't know. Uh, I don't, I'm not in a position. I was on the Intelligence Committee for eight years. But among the discoveries that I made by being on the 9-11 Commission, when I didn't have staff to actually do the work, uh, I had to do it myself. There were five secure environments that you would go to. And you would sit there and you'd take notes. Uh, and as Sandy Berger discovered, 
uh, when he was having to come up for the 9-11 cushion, he goes to try to find out what he had said, and he stuffed some of the documents in his socks. He can't even take the documents out. You take notes, and you have to leave them there. And you have to hope that your memory can hold whatever it is that you saw, and you've got a handler watching you. So the regulatory friction is intense. And my own uh, strongly held view of this whole incident, rather than focusing on whether or not we should assert that somebody should be blessed by God, uh, leaving aside the question whether or not we believe in God to begin with, uh, is... My sister's Presbyterian minister, I have to. <laughs> well, that's not true. <laughs> that's, uh, so, uh, the, 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 I, I believe that the, that the moment uh, should be used to at, begin to ask fundamental questions about how do we... Because intelligence has three parts. You collect it, you analyze it, and then you disseminate the results. And given what's happened over the last 10 or 12 years, and you know this much better than I because you, it's your field of study, uh, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to do a lot more, I would say, crowdsourcing both of the collection and of the analysis. Um, I mean, John Kerry comes forward and says Syrians have used sarin gas, and I got a flashback of Colin Powell at the, at the United Nations holding up a little vial of weapons of mass destruction. So it, it, there's no reason why we couldn't use this as a moment to say, couldn't we crowdsource this uh, and, and, and not only reduce the cost? So more openness would be helpful. I think more openness would be helpful. So Brown, fact, Moses, think, Brown Moses, who's analyzing photos and videos out of Syria, is crowdsourcing Oh, yeah, you're much... You know, when, John, when Secretary Kerry stands up and says, this is what's going on in Syria, uh, you know, if I really want to know what's going on in Syria, I don't wait for the Secretary of State to tell me uh, what's going on in Syria. I don't need the Secretary... I don't, I don't in the NSA, collecting, trying to figure out what's going on. I've got a lot more reliable... Uh, sources out there uh, than what the government itself. In fact, if you talk to the people inside of uh, the, one of the 16 intelligence agencies, they'll tell you the same thing, that they're using free open source content out there right now, and it's more reliable because it's had more hands on it, more eyeballs on it, more individuals expressing their opinion. If you take this piece of paper, the hand you actually, is terrible. did you say this about me? <laughs> if you take this piece of paper, I read it, and you read it, and then we tell the audience what's in it, it'll be two different things. No, not, you know, not diametrically, because you wrote it, so you, you, you have more emotion attached to it, more knowledge of what it means than I do. But that's what happened with the 9-11 Commission. Uh, the, the presidential daily briefings, we didn't actually get to see them. Uh, uh, two individuals went and read them, and my objection was, well, how do I know? You read one thing and see something, and I read it and see something entirely different. Uh, crowdsourcing can solve that problem. So you, you get more sets of eyeballs, more opinions, more likely that you trust the results of the analysis. It doesn't mean that you still aren't going to keep some collection secrets, some analysis secrets, some dissemination secrets. But there's an opportunity, it seems to me, uh, to uh, take advantage of this moment. And rather than debating who did what to whom, uh, look, look at it as an opportunity to, re I think, rethink about how we collect, analyze, and disseminate. Okay, and I would have ended there, but I just going to go back to the point before. Did Snowden and did The Guardian go too far? I don't, you know, I... Uh, did you know, they, did they har what harm have they done? I mean, I'm not going to sit up here and say I'm going to refuse unless you pull out my fingernails to discuss this topic. I don't know if they went too far. I mean, but look, uh, there's no question Snowden violated U.S. law. Uh, I mean, the, there's a law, and you either violated it or you didn't. He violated new U.S. law. Uh, and, and, and there has to be consequences to that. I don't begin by trying to have a debate, is he a traitor, should be shot, and all that sort of stuff, but we have a law. He should, uh, in my, own, my opinion, the people who gave him the, the security clearance made a terrible mistake. Uh, I mean, I, look, I, I just, I'm on the Defense Policy Board. I just went through this whole process of, uh, you know, where have you traveled the last 10 years? What did you drink while you were there? Who do you know? Is there, well, the great question was, is there anything in your past that if it was misrepresented would cause you trouble? <laughs> uh, how about my birth? Hmm. You know, I mean, anything in your past. Mis they're using this sort of old James Bond, are you going to be blackmailed? I mean, if you want to find somebody that you can actually trust, it, you, you make a decision based upon a lot of different characterizations. I, I'm much more likely to trust somebody who spent 10 years in the joint than somebody who spent 10 years in the mother's basement. Uh, so, I mean, they, they made a decision here to classify, to, to give this individual access to our most important secrets, and it reveals, you know, another problem with secrecy. You, you know, because you're, you're it, it's very difficult to have a discussion, very difficult yes. to do the analysis. And so I'm, I'm much more interested in that side of okay, it than I, I think, am. I think, I think we all are. Yokai, well, you, um, we all are here, I think. Okay. Uh, uh, you talk about the openness of networks, but the ability of networks to, to communicate, to cooperate with each other, that depends upon information. Uh, where does whistleblowing fit 
in a, a healthy, democratic, networked society. So this actually ties to the last point about um, there's a law. There's a law, but the law is always um, affected by politics and judgment uh, within the framework. So to my sense, uh, even though clearly Snowden violated that particular set of laws, it should be part of any discussion of reforms to uh, include particular individual amnesty or amnesty that's sufficiently broadly defined uh, to exclude liability there. Because clearly when someone opens up to the public a matter that is of such enormous public concern that leads to such broad uh, acceptance of the need for change and for reform, that person ought not come under the thumb of criminal prosecution. Um, I don't want to endorse President Obama's view of looking forward, not back when it comes to torture, but that's a decision. Here is somebody who did something that was clearly opposed to law, and we're not going to prosecute. Without making, as I said, the false analogy between something that I think is inexcusable and something that I think is, is uh, largely justified, um, I think there's room for saying, yes, he broke the law, but that's not the end of the story. But you're, you're not saying, you're, you've made a decision that, he, that he's innocent, that he should not be prosecuted. Yes. All right, so. Uh, uh, those are two different things. Uh, One is innocent and the other is shouldn't be prosecuted. Okay. And you're saying both? Uh, I'm saying shouldn't be prosecuted. Oh, my God. Okay, now, now, now go to your uh, testimony and that's, about. And that's as a social decision. Go to your no. testimony about, about Chelsea Manning at, at, at her trial uh, and the role of the whistleblower in that case in a journalistic function in society. Again, I think this is tied to the question of secrecy and the way in which secrecy undermines democratic accountability and the good functioning of systems uh, internally. I think part of what we've seen as the materials have come out as we look at the Snowden and NSA affair, uh, more so even than the Manning and WikiLeaks story, is that the existing systems of oversight and accountability failed repeatedly and predictably in ways that were comprehensible to people inside the system, but against which we fa they found themselves unable to uh, resist because of the concern with terrorism, uh, uh, with, with national security. So as you described what it was to sit without being able to make notes, without being able to mm -hmm. take them out, this is a fundamental use of the claim of operational secrecy to undermine that layer of democratic accountability and openness of debate over the basic normative choices that we have with this delegated model where you have the select committees or you have the particular 9-11 commi commission that um, gives you a certain sense that here's the oversight. That gets undermined when people can't be staffed properly and when people can't debate and when the number is too small. Similarly, we saw it with the courts repeatedly, the fact that these were not public decisions, the fact that these were closed in certain ways, you see the judges expressing frustration. For three years you told me one thing, then you did another. I come back two years later, for the last two years you told me you did something else, now I'll do something around here. Again, the secrecy plays out. We see it in the Inspector General's report over the President's Surveillance Program, the original warrantless wireless program, the way in which secrecy was used to rewire the DOJ process, the Department of Justice process, of, of uh, um, oversight by Office of Legal Counsel over Justice Department, uh, over White House decisions. Again, who's read into the program, who, who isn't, rewires oversight. So what the whistleblower does is bring an individual conscience to break through all of these systems. It can't be relied upon as a systematic everyday thing. It has very narrow and almost random insights into the system, but it can be relied on occasionally to break through these layers of um, helplessness within the system of actually exposing them. Okay, so you, you've, you've gone through three layers of protection here, and Rebecca, if you're not, I will get to you, but I wanna uh, parse this a little Don't bit worry. more. Um, one is oversight by Congress, one is oversight by courts, and one is oversight by whistleblower, by conscience, let's call it. Okay, let's, let's cut those apart for just a second here. By Congress, what needs to be done? I, I, I think when we spoke a week ago, you believe the present oversight in Congress has its limitations. Your example of the 9-11 Commission is not Congress per se, but is an example of, of not being uh, as well equipped as you might have wanted. What is necessary for appropriate oversight of Congress first? Then we're gonna go to court. 
Well, I mean, I think the Congressional Oversight is weak. It was established intentionally weak in the middle 70s following Watergate. There wasn't any oversight prior to that, or it was a handful of people with special access. But the, the, so the, the, Congress, the committees were established with relatively weak authorities. The best way of seeing how they've used their limited authorities, I think, uh, to even weaken themselves more is, to my knowledge, and I, I appreciate that that's grand jury language, um, there's been no issuance of subpoenas by either the House uh, Select Committee or the Senate Select Committee. And among the levers that the 9-11 Commission used, even though our authority ran out, we did, it was a limited time frame, meaning that you're, you're constantly evaluating uh, do we have enough time to press this case against a constitutional argument of, of executive privilege, which is what they were always saying to us? Uh, we issued two subpoenas for witnesses and documents. Uh, and, and there are times, I mean, the, the, the president of your own party, doesn't really matter. You've got to come with oversight. Well, I would say with a really constant, militant uh, sense of skepticism for everything that's being said to you. And you, you've got to use the authority, and they had, I don't think they have. Do you think we're hearing that sense of skepticism from Congress today? I think you're hearing it from some. You're hearing it from Senator Wyden, Wyden certainly. Yes. Uh, I think you've heard it from Rand Paul as well. Mm -hmm. I think you're hearing it from, from some in an appropriate way. Uh, but I just keep with the exhibit, the exhibit that I offered, uh, rather than getting into the, the, psych, the psychology okay. of it, no subpoena has been issued by either the House or the Senate. And you, you, you're just not going to get, no, no matter, it could be, it could be your, your best friend uh, as President of the United States or running the NSA. It doesn't really matter. Uh, failure to issue a subpoena is a sign that oversight isn't being done correctly. The courts. We just saw a bunch of documents released uh, uh, this week. Um, about the FISA court rubber stamping, as has, has been accused before, but seems to be the case, uh, but some concerns about what was happening. Are the, can a secret court possibly be a sufficient oversight? I think some of the materials that have been disclosed and quite possibly on purpose suggest something quite different from a rubber stamp. A rubber stamp assumes complete acceptance of everything, in which case you wouldn't get these kinds of opinions that we're seeing that are so frustrated with what's going on. I think it's less a rubber stamp and more a deep um, um, incapacity. Um, and partly this may have to do with the fact that it's not public and not visible. And so the, the, the necessity of explaining yourself to others within your professional community. I think one of the things that keeps judges honest is their own sense of their role. But part of the thing that keeps them honest is the need to write down reasons that are broadly speaking plausible within a professional community. Um, and that's missing in this context. Um, the other thing is obviously just the, the selection of people who are broadly speaking security minded and security conscious that will push them in that uh, direction. So I think that a highly selected court that is selected in order to perform certain tasks and then is highly constrained from knowing all the evidence, from having its opinions uh, written uh, publicly, uh, from being able to follow up with continuous uh, 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 looking in and inquiry. All of these things together make this a very weak model, and a model that as we see, here's the controversial thing. As best I can tell, a model that has failed. Failed in the sense that once things are exposed, it is extremely difficult to find broad approval that yes, everything is done exactly right. And you see the persistent, repeated leaks of the opinions that basically express frustration. Uh, so I think the court has failed uh, partly and has probably succeeded minimally, uh, but at the end of the day, not gotten us to where we need to get in the way that perhaps congressional oversight uh, has, um, um, done even less of, uh, but I'm not sure. Um, it's very weak. Well, I want to come back, I'm going to come back in a few minutes to this notion of oversight by conscience. Uh, but first, oversight by journalism. Rebecca, you taught me a great deal uh, in the early days of Global Voices and in your, in your work in, about North Korea and in China, uh, about not constantly having an American-centric view of the world and now of the internet. Um, part of the fear that we have about what's happened here in a very tactical level is that journalists are going to have a very difficult time communicating with sources without the 
belief on the source's part that what they're doing is perhaps being known and that that puts a chill. That's new as a concept, I think, in America. It's not new in some of the countries that you cover. Talk for a moment about spying, oversight, chill, and fear in journalism in other nations and how that works and, and how you should take lessons from that for us in America. Well, um, more broadly for a minute, I mean, if, if, you, if you have pervasive, unaccountable surveillance anywhere, be it here, be it in China, be it in Turkey, be it, you know, I don't care where it is. If you have pervasive, unaccountable surveillance, investigative journalism becomes very difficult. I mean, we've already seen a, a survey that was just released last week by the Penn American Center in which they were interviewing American writers who are beginning to self-censor on their web searches, on their online research, on their email communications, doing research with sources because they don't feel confident that they are not going to be triggering surveillance or that somehow their networks are, are going to get tracked because a lot of writers, of course, have you know, international uh, you know, communications of, of lots of different kinds. Um, and of course, this is not an unfamiliar thing in, in a lot of countries. Um, in, in a lot of countries, you know, I, I worked as a journalist in China for many years, and you just kind of assumed that anything electronic was not secure. You know, you could, you could take some steps, um, you know, and that if, if uh, uh, you know, that the you sort of obscurity, you know, mild security and obscurity, of, you know, when you're doing kind of low level things, but if I wanted to meet with a, a source who was a dissident or a critic of the government in China, I would never email them to set up an appointment. I would never even call them. I would show up at their house late at night, sneaking in, you know, kind of taking measures not to be detected by cameras. You know, if you want to have a secure conversation, a genuinely secure conversation, not only do you have to have it in person, but you have to have it in the woods, having made very sure that there's no other humans around, leaving your cell phones way back home, because of course we know that cell phones can be turned on even when they're turned off, as long as the battery is in, and can be used as a tracking device and a surveillance device, a recording device. So, you know, that's, that's you know, sort of operational security uh, for a journalist in many countries for a long time now has been, you wanna do something secure, you have to be completely analog. Uh, and I think now a lot of people in this country and, and, and other democratic nations where people haven't been thinking too much about these issues are starting to say, oh my goodness, I really need to think about this. You know, I've been doing some teaching at a law school and, the, and, and lawyers are starting to say, oh my goodness, you know, we are not doing enough to protect our communications with our clients. I have an uncle who's an immigration lawyer. You know, this is a real concern. You know, what's going on with his emails and the, and the, 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 tra the, the tracking of his communications patterns with his clients and so on. Right, and there's, it's, there's it's, a couple it's issues here. There's, there's an issue of, 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 of hygiene that the journalists should follow, right? I talked to my mm -hmm. colleague at CUNY last week about making sure that we teach every single student at CUNY how to encrypt email and to publish their public keys, right? It's something that just all journalists should do now. A lot of other things like that. All right, fine, that accepts the reality, but we don't want to accept this reality. No, of course not. So no, how do we is, look we, at this? We do not want to be living in that kind. Exactly. Uh, you know, so you need laws, you need accountability. That's where I'm headed. So, so uh, what, are, what do those laws look like? Well, do we already have them and they're just being violated? Do we need new laws? No, I mean, we, we need privacy laws. We obviously need to, to reform the Patriot Act. We need to reform the FISA Amendments Act. You know, we, we need legal reform. Uh, you know, there's, there's a Surveillance Transparency Act, there's, you know, this USA Freedom Act, all, all of which are trying to get at various reforms. Um, but, but also you need companies to be more accountable. And we're going to get back and, to that in a second. I, I, get back I to also want to talk about the fact that this is not just a U.S. thing. Right. Right? And um, if you want to go somewhere else first, fine. But I, I, I have a point to make about how unaccountable surveillance, un unaccountable pervasive surveillance in the United States 
will destroy the free and open internet. Stay right and there. It will make it much harder. It will make it much harder for activists in any country Amen. to successfully advocate for political. I just want to get a quick answer from Bob about this point you raised. That, that's a huge topic. But I don't, don't want to create in a second. Well, so what about the Patriot Act and the FISA Act? Do they need to be revi revised? They, they, I would say the answer is yes. But I'm, I'm, I'm just so that it doesn't get lost on the audience. I see a danger. Right? Mohammed Atta in a cafe in Hamburg, Germany, didn't look like an army. He went on the internet and he shopped for the cheapest flight schools in the United States of America. They moved their cash in order to organize that effort using the internet. There's a danger out there. So, I mean, I just want to assert that. Assert that. And I, I don't think every time you get a team of people working on the danger, one person can say, oh, I don't like what we're doing, and as an act of conscience, blow everything we're, we're doing and say, I'm not going to be prosecuted. Well, let's stay that's right, how I, right I, I just, I I just want to put that out okay. to the audience so you know what my view is. Secondly, I don't think our, 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 that we're even close to having unaccountable surveillance. Uh, I just, not by, by any stretch of the imagination, is that the case. Congress is enormously, now, I, I think it's not good oversight, but my God, we, there's been lots of, long before Snowden, long before Manning, Lots of analyses of the intelligence community. Lots of knowledge that, that's been disseminated. Lots of, and if you ask me, who am I, am, I, am I more afraid today of information that Google is collecting on me than I am of the NSA? Uh, I'm, I'm much more worried about what's going on, on the commercial side than what my government. What kind that's of account, what, what, what kind what, of accountability what, what, do I have on, from with, that's with, well, with no? Wait, what wait, what kind of accountability do I have with oversight of private sector surveillance? Okay, well, let me try to. The answer that. is we none. Let me, let me, Unless oh, I'm a big share that. owner. Let me address that. We absolutely need that too. Oh, well, but, but, oh, but, Bob, yeah. wait a what second. If, Bob, what if your Bob, wife decides, as an act of conscience, that she's going to disseminate everything that you and she did last night as a part of a divorce proceedings? I mean, at some point, that's it gets. That's not what Google's doing. Let me answer your Google question. <laughs> okay. When I have a, I have a willful, a, a willing transaction with Google to tell them where I am, so when I ask for pizza, I get pizza near me. I do not have a willing transaction with the NSA to be looking at all my email and all of my metadata and every communication on and the it's internet. And it's willing because you have 15 different companies and I have that you can get to every go to. Yes. Really? Yes, I can go to Bing. I don't trust Microsoft well either, collect, but I can go to well Bing. <laughs> right? I can go to other places. This trope of willing voluntary is mm -hmm. a little overstated. Okay. Let's just say we're stuck in a system of pervasive private and public it, surveillance that is a problem in different ways. There's a difference. Google can manipulate all sorts of things that I know or not. The government can decide to uh, uh, crack down on me politically in some way or another within certain constraints or others. The government can certainly crack down on me if I'm a national security journalist or associated in any way with national security journalism. So the willingness is a really powerful idea that I think is false, as is the national emergency. Right. The idea that at the beginning, the opinion last week that came down from the First Circuit Court of Appeals in the case of Tarek Mehana opened with the words, terrorism is the modern day equivalent of the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague wiped out 30, a third of Europe's population. Terrorism is not that. Terrorism is something that societies learn how to live with. I know, I grew up in Israel. You learn how to live with it. You don't end up undermining everything you stand for on the theory of the state of emergency. It's extremely important that we stop. I sat in Boston with my kids, 600,000 people shut down for a day because the system panics over an event that was painful but small. All right, this goes back to a question that we talked about before, necessary security, but I want to bring it back to something Bob just said a minute ago. The one person who claims conscience who blows it in your view, the one person who claims conscience who should be enabled to. I want to I want to explore this notion of conscience. And we're going to get to the internet as a whole, but I want to explore this first. This notion of the person of conscience, both from a whistleblower sense, but also that if you are, let's say, an employee inside a technology company, you're inside Google or you're inside level three, more likely the case, and level three comes to you and says, you're going to put a tap on all the traffic on the internet, right? Does that person, that technologist who has the power of technology behind them have a right, a responsibility, or neither of the above to say too much? Where, where does the, the person of conscience in this secret society of, of, of surveillance stand? What, 
what, what is justifiable, what is necessary, what should we expect of our technologists and their power, and what not. I don't know what the, I don't know what the law, Yokai's ready to let them off, and you're, you're, you're I think, a bit appalled at them. I don't know how to, how to parse this. I also don't I, know I how just, to go to my Jeff, friends. I just have trouble with the language of secret society and surveillance and, and unaccountable surveillance. I mean, uh, there's a significant, I have a significant problem with prison. I have a significant problem with oversight. But to go from that to language that says that we have unaccountable surveillance is inaccurate. It might be great when you're twittering a message, but it's not accurate. Uh, Rebecca? It's just just, just to, to follow up on that, because I, I think you're reacting to the phrase I used. We have a situation. I do listen to words. That's exactly yeah, yeah. right. Um, we have a problem right now where when abuse has been occurring, if it hadn't been for Snowden, those abusing their power would not have been held accountable. So it's not to say that there's no accountability or effort at accountability in the system and that it's completely unfettered. But the fact that abuse has gone unpunished, unnoticed, is a fact. Look. And, and that is a failing in the system. In, 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 our, in our digital world right now, if we cannot ensure, and, and I agree, this, is, this also goes to companies. I have a lot of beefs with companies as well, but we have this nexus between you know, uh, corporate and government power where, it is, where the abuse of power on both sides is not being held sufficiently accountable. There's not enough mechanisms to identify when abuse is taking place and to visit consequences on those who are abusing that power. And this is our problem. Not to say that it's completely, you know, free for all, NSA does everything we want. I'm not saying NSA equals the so Chinese you, you're, are you saying Secret that, Service, let me ask you, let me prep but I'm point. saying we're, we're lacking sufficient accountability to prevent serious abuse. So you, you, many of you say, first of all, we didn't know about it. Wyden was talking about a number of people were saying. Yeah, but going. nobody was paying attention. Wyden constantly but, but again, it's us. an exaggeration to say that nobody is paying attention. You, I'm listening. Not enough people were paying that's attention. A, that's maybe more for, accurate. For, for any momentum to take place to hold anybody accountable. To Look, we gave up tremendous, Snowden gave up tremendous capabilities. So you can say, oh, gee, I, it wasn't great. We, we now know lots of things that we didn't know what, before. Klaus say, Fuchs did the same thing. Yeah. Do you think Klaus Fuchs, Klaus Fuchs acted out of conscience. I'm going to give Joseph Stalin the, the technology to build an atomic bomb and to build a hydrogen bomb. Now, it, it was an act of conscience I that wish, he made. I wish Snowden's act had not been necessary. I wish but, Klaus Fuchs's act would not have been but, necessary, but, but the Soviet Union was a clear and present danger. people up. I don't, I just, you I, don't think that really there's a false analogy. That that's what it took, but that's apparently what it took. But you I'm cannot baffled. operate. You can't about op this stuff for you years can't operate a national security operation if anybody on the team can say, as an act of conscience, I'm giving up everything we're doing. He didn't just tell us about Prism. He gave up sources. He gave up methods. He gave up technology. I love Angela Merkel. Oh my God, they're, they're intercepting my cell phones. Well, hell, I knew that 20 years ago. That's yeah, you did. Big, and by the way, they haven't, the, the, Al Qaeda has not identified Germany and Brazil as the number one target. They identified the United States of America. And it is a clear and present danger in my view. And it's very difficult to surveil it. And I, I'm, I'm, I would not have voted for, for Patriot Act. And I think FISA court needs to be modified. And I think we have, need to have much better oversight. I just have trouble with this, this statement that says, gee, on as an act of conscience, if I don't like what, the, what, what we're all doing, I can just give it all up and get the Nobel Prize. You okay? Two, two distinct things. One, I think that the act of making something public and open for public debate is fundamentally different than the act of giving something covertly to an enemy. One actually supports democracy, though at a cost, and the other doesn't. And those are two just fundamental, it's just completely false analogy. And I think the fact that it's very unfortunate that Snowden ended up in Russia because no other country uh, was feasible for him to, uh, w once he moved, helped that analogy with the old history, but I just think it's a fundamentally false analogy. And the second is, um, I forgot the second. It happens to you too. It I happens to me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> All right, let's now go, Rebecca. By the way, I'm not making an analogy. I'm asserting that if you're organizing, an if, you, if you believe 
that there's no threat out there, fine. Well, is there no, no place for no, there's no threat out there. there's no, there's no there need, the place there's for no need for, there's no need, I'm just, let me ask you this. Is there, is there a threat out there that justifies collecting in secret, analyzing in secret? Sure. Some, okay. But you just need to make sure that when abuse takes place, it's held accountable. If, and I, I'm not saying that means that everybody should whistle blow at every opportunity, but we clearly do not have appropriate mechanisms to hold abuse accountable and to identify and abuse when it happens. And whistle became a factor then in and, doing that. And because those mechanisms were insufficient, inadequate, whistle blowing became sort of the, the last resort. Is it we shouldn't need it. Yeah, we get it. I, 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 this was the second point, and, I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm genuinely just trying to understand the limits of, of the position. Um, at what point does conscience require a person to refuse to act in a certain way that they consider that is completely accepted within the system they're in, but they find completely unacceptable to their conscience? And is it specifically about the public disclosure, or is it more about the point of, at the end of the day, you're playing a role in this system, it's your role, and the system gets to decide what the right thing to do or not. That is the key question. What is the role of conscience? What, 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 we can't eliminate it, can we, Bob? Where, where does conscience I'm not, properly? I'm not, I'm not suggesting you eliminate the role of conscience. The question is, what do you, what's your action? Do you say, I'm gonna put it all out there and I'm going to Hong Kong? Uh, what, what do you do? Uh, uh, with it. That's the question that I've got. And, if, and, and, and if I do it, if I break the law as a, as a part of an act of conscience, is my expectation that I'm not subject to the penalties under the law. Does it matter how bad the conduct you did expose and how grave the direct operational uh, 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 damage you caused? So if, for example, the thing you're disclosing in order to stop mm -hmm. is systematic torture of detainees, does that make it bad enough that disclosure, even though illegal, ought not be prosecuted? Well, I mean, first of all, there was, a, there was a fairly extensive internal investigation of that matter after it was disclosed. I mean, it's, and as it was disclosed by multiple sources, that particular, you're talking about Abu Ghraib, or uh, you're talking about the, act, the I'm black... Tr I'm, I'm trying to find something where I suspect we both agree that as a matter of morality line, is yes. wrong, and the question, and trying to create a relatively clear space to say, this is a place where conscious can stand I, I don't think you're ever going to get a relatively clear space. Uh, I mean, I'm not here to say that Snowden should be shot. I'm just merely saying, first of all, there is a danger that necessitates yes. organizing in a secret way the collection, the analysis, and the dissemination of intelligence. And, and when, once you start doing that, it's very difficult in, the, in today's world to draw the line. Was Manning over punished? I mean, what's the chill on that in your view? Oh, I think uh, my answer is emphatically yes. Uh, I mean, I, so, if so you're trying I, to- what effect that to, has on someone of conscience who says, I think I found something terribly illegal and wrong. I want to expose this, but I'm not going to now because my God, look how- But what, what, what role does punishment have in 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 in, in this Because you're trying to say that, that Snowden should have stayed as a civil disobedient and faced the music and you'd respect him more, right? And he probably no, would I, have if it hadn't been for what happened to Manning. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, uh, all right. Uh, let's, let's, all I'm, I'm, my beginning point, I'm not, I'm not trying to draw an, an ideal narrative for Edward Snowden. I'm merely saying he broke the law. And, and if you allow anyone inside of this organization to say, as an act of conscience, uh, I'm, I'm going to break the law, and deliver every, 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 every source, every method, every technology that we've got, just deliver I'm, I'm it all. Still, Yokai's, still, I, I, I just Yo, Yokai's still trying to get a line where, then is there no line you, at all for breaking the law on the purpose of conscience because I, you believe that perhaps your no, not, government has broken the law? I'm not saying, I, I actually don't think there is. I don't think we can get to a point where you can say it satisfies, it has to satisfy these five things and we'll write it into a rule or a reg. Yokai, or a is there a law you can break? Um, that enables whistleblowing in certain circumstances? I would certainly, uh, what I would do with this regard is identify a, a core principle that when a whistleblower discloses uh, facts that are, uh, that actually lead 
to significant public debate and change in policy, that is to say a public rejection, whether through judicial action or through legislative action, of reversal, that is the core or heart of what needs to be protected in whistleblowers. So there's still I, a risk for the whistleblower, but the but whistleblower you, you has the opportunity You didn't for, like the example of Klaus Fuchs earlier, but he certainly would have provoked a debate about whether or not we shouldn't share the technology of nuclear weapons. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I, I think it, it's, 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 it's a sound suggestion, but once you convert it to writing and say it's now a hard rule, it doesn't allow for what conscience dictates, which is flexibility. I've decided as an act of conscience, I must do this. But, but what, what I'm hearing is, if it's an act of conscience, there's no punishment. No, we're just that's looking not, for the rules that's for not conscience. What I say. That's or, not or what I said. I think that's what I heard. People are just, you know, or you just have, you know, civil disobedience. And people have always broken the law and accepted that they would go to jail, but decided it was, you know, they were going to do this for their country or, or for, you know, the principle of it. But then the question you know, is, what does a democratic respect. society do about that? Yeah. Okay. 35 years. We change the law often. I mean, that's what civil disobedience has, has resulted in. in, in yes, and we're, we're having difficulty generation. writing that law. I want to I wanna, I wanna come back to this, <laughs> right? but I want to shift now, Rebecca, to uh, a, 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 a a topic matters to all of us is the impact on the net. And and why don't you start there as you were trying sure, to start before yeah. and then I want to. So wanna... my friend back here has a, a website queued up that I'd like to show because I, I think it kind of helps to illustrate the issue we're it's facing and, and those of us here can see it here. So, so, so this map was generated by the Oxford Internet Institute and it's, it's interesting particularly when you overlay the, in, the information in this map with the Snowden NSA revelations. Now I'll explain what this is. So all the red countries on this map are countries where Google is the number one most popular website in that country. Countries that are blue are countries where Facebook is the number one most popular website on, in that country. There's only five countries on the planet that are not red or blue. The purple is an anonymy, it's Japan, they really like Yahoo. We'll just kind of put that aside. <laughs> They're nostalgic. You know, the, the, the yellow, and, and the, 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 con the countries have all been resized based on the size of their internet population. That's why it's very distorted. So the little yellow thing is Russia and, and some Russian internet services, which I won't kind of get into the details about. The big green is China. Right. China's number one most popular website is Baidu. Now when you overlay this, the information of this map with what the world has learned from Snowden, China's sitting there going, boy have we been smart with our great firewall. It's been the best thing for our national security we possibly could have done. That's what they're saying. And a lot of other countries, not just authoritarian ones, are saying, you know, maybe we need to get a bit more like China in how we control our networks. Name one. It's being called data sovereignty. Name Brazil, one. Brazil, Germany, Name. you know, a number of countries are talking about There are people inside of that country that are sure. talking about it, but There's they don't have the command and control that the Politburo has in China. Sure, w but we're gonna see. There's enough discussion about this there's, the, in Brazil, the reaction to this is very strong. You gotta, I mean, seriously, do you, th the people in, do you think people are seriously in Germany saying we want to do what China is doing? No, they're not saying we want to no. do what China is doing, but what they're saying is this. They're saying that if you want to serve customers who are citizens of our country, you have to put the data in our national borders so that we have sovereignty to, over And it. also to protect against America now, which right. is the argument being made across Europe. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an economic argument being made. When we had earlier today, we had uh, the head of AWS at, 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 at Amazon who says this is now a business opportunity, but the truth is we right. know there's economic impact and, of right. American cloud companies being resisted by Huge. Canada even. No, the, I mean the estimated potential loss to, for, for American cloud computing business is you know, in the tens of billions. Um, but. The other, the other thing is, is that you, you, know, you have an increasing, I mean, Indonesia has been discussing a, a data kind of sovereignty law as well about, you know, there's, these right, laws so, so are coming let's, up. Let's, let's. So what this means is, 
is that in, you, you're seeing now a trend where governments are talking about, okay, because you know the NSA via these American services is accessing all this stuff, and by the way, while our laws and protections protect U.S. persons, which are American citizens plus U.S. residents, the checks and balances, flawed though they are, existence though they are, don't foreigners. apply to the rest of the right. world's human beings. And so therefore, if you're a business and your major growth area is non-U.S. persons, those are all your future customers, and US and you're headquartered in the United States and US law basically says Americans US persons have rights and non-US persons pretty much have no rights. Which is the importance rights. of the Guardian story today that the yeah. NSA is indeed spying on citizens of right. other nations. That's with their problematic. Help. And so then you have government saying, okay, not as extreme as China, but nonetheless you get popular reactions, you get a lot more public support behind efforts by governments and by opportunistic telecommunications companies mm -hmm. and others that kind of see money-making opportunities to win business away from the American companies that have been eating their lunch. You see a very kind of opportunistic coalition in a lot of countries towards laws that are going to require right. you know, data to and be you have, located. And you have other, other laws going on at the same time where right. you have David Cameron today uh, uh, talking about uh, in the UK uh, uh, enabling the GCHQ to go after child porn. Mm -hmm. You have efforts yeah. to filter so the entirety yeah. of the net of that in Australia thing. and Canada you, you based have on India child porn. India setting up a, a surveillance mechanism without any sort of passage of any parliamentary yeah. act, et cetera. You know, there's all this stuff going on that, that you know, governments have all, are also going to use this opportunistically. I'm not saying it's going to be good for the citizens' rights in any particular country. But what I'm saying is that politically, this politically and economically and, and in terms of sort of business momentum, this is a really unfortunate trend. And but what it's gonna potentially result in, this also then collides with a huge fight that's going on over internet governance. Yes. And how point. how internet standards and protocols are set. Um, how the domain whom, name system is whom? managed by whom, to to whether it's meant point. to be the United Nations, whether it's meant yes. to be the multi-stakeholder private system we whether have. The US is trusted and the, anymore. and there's, there was, you know, there was a coalition last year that kind of prevented the move to UN governance, but that coalition has fallen apart in the wake of the NSA resolution. Res you have written brilliantly about the wealth of networks, about the potential of networks, about about how the internet properly can operate and what can come of this. What is the impact of, let's focus on the NSA, but all these other efforts to, 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 to deal with internet governance in new ways, to take over some of this power from the US, to, to be fearful of it. What is this gonna do to the potential of the net? Um, I actually, I, uh, th there's a practical layer at which I understand, at, at which I agree with Rebecca, but I would focus on actually something else that is partly about the net and partly about the national security increasing exception to the Bill of Rights and the state of emergency, which is to say <clears throat> there's a certain coherence between the public ideology of the United States as a free country based in the Constitution, respecting the civil rights, that played an incredibly important role in both um, um, uh, projecting the importance of these values publicly but also connecting them to the values of an open internet on the standards-based model. What we've seen narrowly in the area of surveillance and more broadly in the area of detention, in the area of torture and accountability, is that over the last 12 years, we have accepted a retreat from a very foundational conception of rights and democracy in exchange for a state of emergency. And then the question becomes, whose state of emergency? Is it China's threat model? Is it Iran's threat model? Is it the threat model of any other country? And where do we stand in a privileged position to say our threat model is genuine, yours is trumped up? So Bob, that's a more nuanced expression that the two just made about this question, I think. What's your reaction to what you've just heard about us internet people, if we can be so obnoxious as to call us that, we all are, <laughs> but 
our concerns about what's happening to the net itself? Well, <clears throat> the NRL, if, if, if you, I presume you're talking about how do I feel about the relationship between genuine security issues and the desire to be as free and open as I possibly can Bingo. be, right? Yep. Well, I don't, again, I don't think there's a perfect answer here. I mean, it, 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 we're, we've been constantly, uh, my, my favorite example of this was Shortly after uh, Newt Gingrich's uh, ill, uh, that wasn't ill fate, it was successful effort to take over the House in 94, he came into power in 95, they took up a crime bill. And uh, a Democrat, whose name I actually forgotten, uh, put up the Fourth Amendment, and it failed. I mean, if you look at the language of the Fourth Amendment, but it's suggested as a statute, uh, that's the one against unreasonable search and seizure, which we're actually talking about. It's a four, we're talking mm -hmm. about a Fourth mm -hmm. Amendment mm -hmm. issue. Um, so, yeah, I, do I think that generally that Americans uh, maybe have forgotten the ideas that underlie the document itself and why it's there? Do you, I think that they're confused in the Internet age when things are moving in packets and faster and, and, and things move so fast that even going to a journal uh, puts you there too late to understand what's actually going on today? So do I, do I, am I, am I genuinely concerned about uh, losing a, a First Amendment right? No. Uh, I mean, the only, the only evidence of losing your First Amendment right is people just being unwilling to say what they think is the truth. And I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about somebody who is going to suffer the penalty, perhaps, of, of jail time. Well, but, 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 but what about, the, what about the, the, the impinging of the freedom of the press to do its job because its work is potentially surveilled? That's an impingement on the First Amendment, isn't it? Look, I, I, I did a CNN interview yesterday, and I saw the poster for the new Crossfire. Have you seen it? You seen the poster for the new crossfire? Remember, I'm looking around as if anybody looks as old as I am. Remember the old crossfire? I the old crossfire was a real debate. I left it. The new crossfire has this geezer on the right, Newt Gingrich, and two really hard-bodied women like this with low-cut dresses and a, and a African American guy with a shaved head. Uh, it's no. If you, if you look at the the political debate, what I'm worried about is. We've lost our capacity to do the work. I mean, you, you say, okay, if I put up a 50,000 word analysis of what's going on in the world today, it's a little bit too long for the average reader, wouldn't you say? Uh, uh, it wasn't too long in the 18th century. Uh, it wasn't too long in the 19th century. So I'm, what I'm worried about is, I'm worried about a lot more than the loss of a First Amendment. I'm worried about people losing the capacity to take advantage of their freedom. Rebecca, tweet and length, and then I want to go to the room. Who wants to join in the yeah, conversation? Yeah, um, as, as someone who left CNN because it was just getting too insipid, I, I, I sympathize with your point. But but I think, there, you know, that's kind of taking us a little off, you know, the, the subject here. I mean, yeah, media is is well, you're just taking off the subject from your point of view, but not from my point of view. The question was, am I concerned about a deterioration of my rights as a citizen against the national security state? And I, my and answer was- the media was, is failing no, its job. No, no, to, I'm, to it isn't so much the media. I'm talking, debate. the media is responding to the marketplace. The media is giving citizens what they want. I mean, Grand Theft Auto sold a billion dollars worth of games in three days. So I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, what the media is doing. I'm talking about what the media is doing in response to the market, the citizens, and their capability to use their First Amendment mm -hmm. rights to have this kind of discussion. I, I'm baffled about when this, this great uh, uh, golden age of uh, people fire. in the general population reading 50,000 word uh, pieces and whether it was in the, in the television newscast, three channels, one newspaper town era, I doubt it. So the question to me is, uh, I, I would resist the notion that online, those who want information can't find it much more uh, richly and diversely and from a much greater diversity of sources and being able to cross-reference than was true 10, certainly 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Let me please. I, don't, I, don't, I actually don't disagree with that, but that, that's not the argument that I'm making there. And it's not really an argument, it's an expression of concern. And, I, and you can actually track the size of analytical content inside of newspapers. And it's, it, there's no question it's been diminished. There's no question it's getting smaller. No question there's an audience incapability of, of taking too long a message. I mean, the whole, anyway, I thought I'm a We have one, one point on that. Hero, mid-hero, <laughs> fix that.